If you would remain standing to honor God's Word, which comes to us this morning from Mark's Gospel, the 8th chapter, verse, beginning at verse 22. They came to Bethsaida. Some people brought a blind man to him and begged him to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. And when he had put saliva on his eyes and laid his hands on him, he asked him, can you see anything? And the man looked up and said, I can see people, but they look like trees walking. Then Jesus laid his hands on his eyes again and looked intently and his sight was restored and he saw everything clearly. Then he sent him away to his home saying, do not even go into the village. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. I want to say hello to those who are worshiping online and those who are worshiping on our South Campus. Uh, this morning, we are certainly glad that you are with us. Maybe, perhaps, perhaps you have seen what God has done. But can you see what he could do? Let us pray. Oh God, as we again place our lives in front of your word, we ask again that we might see more clearly and that another drop of amazing grace might flow down on our hearts. We ask in the name of the Word made flesh, Jesus Christ. Amen. In this series of sermons, we are asking the question, what would it look like, what would it be like if Jesus moved into our neighborhood? And we are looking at the gospel accounts of when Jesus moved into a neighborhood and, and how did he act with people when he met them, different types of people. We talked about how Jesus met Zacchaeus and when he was up in the sycamore tree and Jesus was, was so wonderfully welcoming and compassionate and forgiving and tender with Zacchaeus. And then we saw last week how Jesus was stern and angry, even furious with the religious leaders who were putting a, such a heavy burden on people and taking God's word and twisting it and making it as something that wasn't a gift, but it was a burden upon people's lives. This morning, we see another side of Jesus. We, we see a very patient and tender side. Mark tells us that some people asked Jesus to touch a blind man. Jesus took the man by the hand and led him out of the town of Bethsaida. And then Jesus took saliva and placed it on his eyes. He spit into his hand and put it on this blind man's eyes. That seems odd. It seems strange. We have no idea why Jesus did this. I mean, a lot of people have, have contemplated and imagined things, but we really do not know. Maybe it was simply a caring act. Maybe the blind man's eyes were, were crusted and they were shut and they were shut together and Jesus was softening this and, and trying to make it so it would be easier for his eyes to open. We don't know exactly why. But then Jesus, with a very tender voice, said to this blind man, can you see anything? Now, the text implies that Jesus probably already knew that the man's eyesight wasn't fully restored. It's not typical for Jesus to ask that kind of a question after a healing. The man said, I can see people, but they look like trees walking. It's a way of saying, I, I, I can kind of see, but it's blurry. It's, 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 it's odd. It's, it's not, I can know enough to know that it's not 2020 vision. And then Jesus placed his hands on the man's eyes a second time. And then Mark tells us at that moment, he could see everything clearly. 
Now, if you read through the Gospel of Mark or any of the Gospels, maybe for the very first time, you might, when you get to this passage, assume, if you're reading quickly, you might just assume that Jesus' first attempt at a miracle didn't take. His first touch wasn't enough. And not enough power flowed through him the first time he touched this man's eyes. Um, somehow, we might think, well, maybe Jesus' power was limited for some reason. It didn't take. But those of us who've read the gospel story to the end know that Jesus was not lacking in divine power. I mean, that's just not really not a possible interpretation, knowing what we know about Jesus and what he ended up doing and what he could do. So we do have to ask the question, what's going on here? Why did it take two times to touch this man before he could see? I think the context of this story may give us some great insight. Right before this story, the disciples were gathered around Jesus and they watched him miraculously feed 5,000 hungry people. We're going to talk about this text next Sunday. He miraculously fed 5,000 people. I mean, that, this is right before. Can you imagine being in a crowd that big, very, very hungry people, and Jesus performs a miracle, bread, fish, people get eat to their f f fill. The disciples saw this happen. They watched it happen. But not long after the feeding of the 5,000, the disciples and Jesus were confronted with 4,000 very hungry people. And the disciples looked at each other and they said, how are we going to feed all of these hungry people? It's like they had seen what God had done, but they couldn't see what he could do. They'd seen what he had done. He'd already performed that miracle. But for some reason, their eyes couldn't bring themselves to see that Jesus just might well do it again. Later on, the disciples get into a boat and they go across the sea. They're in this boat and they realize that they didn't bring enough bread to eat. And along the way on this sea journey in the boat, Jesus says these words, Beware of the yeast of the Pharisees and of Herod. And the disciples looked at each other and said, you know, we don't know what he's saying, but he must be angry at us for not bringing enough bread. They missed the metaphor. Craig Barnes says that Jesus, preachers, and poets are the only ones who love metaphors. <laughs> After the boat ride, they come to Caesarea Philippi. And Jesus says to the group, these disciples, he looks around at them, he says, who do you say that I am? It's, one of the, it's a great question, right in the heart of the gospel. He says to them, who do you say that I am? And Peter stands up and says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus looks at Peter and says, Peter, your eyesight is so good. You see it clearly. Blessed are you, Peter. Peter. Jesus, I mean, can you imagine Peter's heart at this moment? He's the one out of all the disciples who sees so clearly. And Jesus says, I love the fact that you've got this great eyesight, Peter. You see clearly what I am, what I'm doing, who I am. Peter's pride at that moment. He must have been just, his heart was warmed. I'm the one. Good vision here. I see it. I see what's going on. But right after that, Jesus starts talking about, okay, gang, here's the deal. I need to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to be handed over. I'm going to suffer. I'm going to die. And Peter says, no, 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 time out, time out, time out. No, no. That's not going to happen. And you remember what Jesus says? Get behind me, Satan. Wait a minute. He just had said, I see you who you are clearly. And in the next breath... He couldn't see at all. He couldn't see. He had seen what Jesus had done, but he couldn't see what Jesus could do. Jesus says to his disciples, do you still not see? 
He says to us this morning, do you still not see? This text is not solely about this blind man and how he was healed. I believe it's about the disciples' vision. I believe it's about our vision. Like Peter, I think most of us in this room, like Peter, know and see that Jesus is the Messiah. I think most of us know that. We said the Apostles' Creed earlier in the service, and we affirmed and we see qualities, and we we've said Jesus is the Messiah. We, we know like Peter that that's the right answer. We see it. But do we see him working right now, today, in my family, in my workplace, in my church, in our ministry? Do we see what Jesus could do? If we've learned anything from Mark's Gospel, it is that when it comes to matters of, the, of faith, the disciples and the religious serious are basically blind. Technically, their eyes function just fine, but their vision is severely impaired. Again and again, they do not perceive who Jesus is. They're spiritually blind. When the man says, I see people, but they look like trees walking, I think Jesus could have responded in a couple of different ways, I suppose. I mean, Jesus had brought him outside the village. He had taken the spittle and put it on his eyes and, and did a miraculous thing. And when he says, well, I can't see very well, I'm they look like trees walking. Jesus could have responded at that point and said, here's the deal. I've done my work. Your faith isn't strong enough. Who's next? I mean, very easy. I mean, we, he could say the reason why it's not taking is your fault. It's your problem. It's your sin. It's your heritage. He could have said any number of things like that. But he didn't. Jesus could have said, hey, listen, gang, I'm really busy. I mean, there's a long line of healings. There's a lot of people behind, and, and um, I really don't have time for second touches. Who's, who's ready for a first touch? I'm only doing those today. He could have said that. Instead, he hangs in there. He touches him a second time. Like the blind man, we all need a second touch of grace. And a third, and a fourth, and a whole lot more after that. If we are going to see Jesus' mission and our mission more clearly. In his commentary on this passage, John Calvin said, the grace flowed down upon this man Drip by drip. And that's how it comes to us. And hopefully, along the way of this journey, for you and I, we will have glimpses and we will begin to see everything more clearly. But I think it takes some responsibility on our part. I think it means that we need to say when we wake up in the morning, Lord, will you help me see you today? Lord, will you open my eyes? Lord, I understand that there's so much that I can, can be looking at, but I'm not seeing you here. Would you touch me and would your grace allow me to see what you're doing <clears throat> today in my family, in my workplace, in my church? There's another part of this story that is very curious. Mark tells us that in order to perform this miracle, Jesus led the blind man by the hand to a place outside of the town, outside of Bethsaida, the village. Why? 
I mean, couldn't Jesus have performed this miracle anywhere? Couldn't he have done it in the man's home? Why? Why did he grab him by the hand and say, let's walk. We're going to go outside the town in order for this to happen. I mean, Jesus could have said, right here in the center of town, we're going to set up a miracle shop. We're going to sell tickets, all right? People who want to get miracles can pay a lot of money, and people who want to watch me do miracles can pay tickets to watch me do miracles. We could make a lot of money. We could fund future ministry. I mean, it would be great. We'll have even more crowds. He doesn't do that. Takes him by the hand and says, let's go out. Let's get out of this city. Let's get out of this place. And I think that Jesus wants to get this man away from the place of familiarity. I think he wants to pull him away, walk him away from places of hurt or complaint or places where he is tempted to be a victim. The place where there is just so much human argument and so much anxiety and fear about the future. Jesus wants this man to see and he wants him to see clearly. And to do that, he says, let's get away from all that other things that you could be looking at and focusing on. I want to bring you out so you can clearly see me. We know about this. Many of us have a home that is having unhealthy patterns. It's a place where harsh words are said in anger. It's a place where we become passive aggressive. It's a place where past hurts are rehearsed over and over and over again, where we are surrounded by a group of people who remind you daily that you are less than. I pray that is not the case for you, but I do know it is for so many in our world and our society. Or maybe it's the, uh, the workplace where you are constantly reminded of how you're not doing good enough. You're not affirmed. It's a place where you are so lonely and insecure the daily reminders of pain that that cause you to see only hurt and frustration. It's so difficult to rise above all of that and to see the big picture of what God is doing. Last month, a report surfaced in the news that Facebook had done an internal study. They had looked at their practices and the effect it was having specifically on teenagers. How this got into the media, I don't know. Whether it was leaked or whether that was part of the plan, I don't know. But the media got a hold of this. Years of study by Facebook found its photo sharing app, Instagram, to have harmful effects among a significant portion of its millions of young users, particularly teenage girls. Though the company downplayed the results of this. And I have to believe this was an internal study that the results were probably far worse in reality because this is their own study looking at their own situation. When the report surfaced, they downplayed it. They downplayed that there was any negative effect of looking on screens all day and looking at Instagram. But they found in this research that teens blame Instagram for increases in the rate of anxiety and depression. A reaction research was described as unprompted and consistent across all groups. Furthermore, among teenagers who reported suicidal thoughts, 6% in the United States and 13% in the UK traced them back to Instagram. In response to this, Facebook has decided to double down and create a new Instagram platform targeted for even younger children. You see what's happening here. Young girls are spending their nights and days scrolling through perfect-looking people that have been photoshopped. And the message comes to them very clearly. In order to be acceptable, in order to be worthy, you must look like this. 
And that is repeated every day. It's what they're looking at. It is what they're seeing. And it's having tragic, awful consequence. And as a society, we need to speak against this. And as a church, maybe we need to rise up and say, no more. This is hurting our children. It's crushing them. It's giving them a message that is completely opposite of the good news that God wants to give. The message that comes through is you aren't fearfully and wonderfully made. You're not enough. Do you not think that Jesus wants to take our young people by the hand and say, let's move away from that? Let's not look at that anymore. Let's walk out to a place where we're not seeing that. Because I need you to see me. But what about us? Do you not think that Jesus is saying, in order to see me, you're going to have to move away from cable news shows that teach you how to be so angry at other people. Shows that make you anxious about our country. Shows that tell you that you should be afraid about your future it's not true. Jesus holds this country in the palm of his hands. It's secure. It's safe. He holds the future. I'm not hearing any of that from CNN or Fox News. They're saying, you got to be afraid. And here's who to blame. And I believe Jesus is saying, let's go out and not look at that anymore. I need to show you. I want you to see me. Or is not Jesus saying, let's move away from screen images that objectify women, pornography? You're not going to see me there. He wants to take us by the hand, and please hear this, it is so loving and it's so gentle. He says, I want to show you, I want you to see clearly who I am and what I am doing, and what I'm capable of, and how I see you. So Jesus laid hands on his eyes again. The man looked hard and realized that he had recovered now perfect sight. Saw everything in the bright 2020 focus. Jesus sent him home and said, Go home, but don't go back into the village. <laughs> don't go back to that same place where you were seeing and hearing it was destructive and hard. A few days ago, the pastor of the first church that I served as a, I was an associate pastor, a man named Bob Sanders, he was my boss, he was the senior pastor of the first church that I served. A few days ago, Bob Sanders passed away. He was a gifted and wonderful pastor, a really neat man. And I will never forget when I was serving the church, um, our daughter Hannah was born. And Pastor Bob came to the hospital to visit. Day after she was born, we were in the hospital room. And he walked in and he, he, he greeted us and he took little Hannah in his arms and he began to talk to her. And I will never forget what he said. He wasn't speaking to us. He spoke to her. And he said, Hannah, what must it have been like to see light for the very first time? He goes, I wish you could tell me. I wish you could tell me how startling and marvelous it must have been to see light. Can you imagine what all of us have experienced this. We can't remember, but that must have been just staggering to see light. And then he began to talk and he said, Hannah, someday, someday you're going to see light again. And it will be just as remarkable, if not more. It will be at the end of your life when you enter into heaven. 
Now, at that moment, I thought, isn't it a little early to be talking about my daughter's death? <laughs> Bob, hold on a minute. <laughs> she was just born. <laughs> Not sure we want to be talking about her death just yet. <laughs> but he was right. There are two stunning, remarkable events that are happening in your life. The first you can't remember. It's when you were born. And the second hasn't come yet. The second is for those who are in Jesus Christ, we will see something remarkable. Light. The light of heaven. These two events in our lives are like Mount, both of them are like Mount Everest. And Jesus wants to take us by the hand and say, can you see what I'm doing here? Let's look at the context. Let's look at the big picture. I know you are afraid about the future. I know that you've been involved in argument and all this hard stuff. And you've been told lie after lie after lie. Would you come out? Because I want you to see. He was telling Hannah that the two most important events in your life are ones that God created and orchestrated. And it's true for you and I as well. And today, if we open our eyes, we can see that. What is to come will be remarkable for those who are in Jesus Christ. John Calvin said, the grace flowed down upon this blind man drip by drip. Today, my prayer is that you feel that drip and you experience that wonderful, tender grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Father, we would ask humbly this morning that we might see you. That you might open our eyes to see the work that you did on the cross, for our, that you took care of our sin and prepared a future for us that is going to be glorious. We thank you for Jesus, and it's in his name that we pray. Amen.